Good morning, good morning. It's a lovely morning. White cloud again, Friday the 24th of March. Uh, I'm not, I've just left the paper shop, but I had to nip out quick because there was a, on these small country roads, there's a big uh, premium to be paid if you end up stuck behind something that's really slow and there was a Defender, Land Rover Defender parked in front of me and so we did like a Le Mans start where we both, well he toddled off and I ran, I ran to the car and nipped round him, otherwise I'd be stuck behind him now. I don't mind it occasionally, but oh, you see, no look. Oh my god! <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> I've just gone past a bloke driving a portable, extensible platform. You know, one of those things that go when you know in exhibition centres where they need to fix the ceiling lights, and they have like a big scissor jack type portable thing. And there's a bloke driving down the road in it with a, a beagle on a lead. And he's about six foot up in the air, just driving down the road. There you go. Couldn't make this up, honestly, I couldn't write this. So what are we going to talk about today? Thank you to everybody, actually, who's contacted me. I mean, I'm getting uh, quite a bit of feedback on this. It's not like, you know... It's mostly sort of, you know, quite, sort of quite enjoy watching you rant. So, uh, uh, nobody's really sort of entering into the debate, which is a shame because it would be nice if, if you, obviously, if you think I'm barking up the wrong tree, then, then do tell me, you know, because I'm, I'm a great believer in if you don't agree with someone, then you need to find out why, because one of you is obviously uh, under, under misapprehension, and so, and, if it's me that's under the misapprehension, then I'd like to know straight away. Uh, and that way you can sort of build up a coherent model of the world, can't you? We've all got our models of the world, but some of them are, are more coherent than others. Some of them are more tied into reality than others. So I always like to test my model against uh, any sort of reasonable uh, objections, just to make sure that I'm, I'm still satisfied. Uh, I'm not going mad and... And it's everybody else that's mad, but not me, you know, same as everyone else does. So let's talk about nurses, dental nurses. You've got to love them. Actually, you shouldn't love them because uh, that causes one of the biggest problems that dentists have. Not so much now because we're not so much of a male-oriented profession, but one of my favorite inquiries was at the, at the GDPA, it was always the dentist who rang up and said, uh, uh, look, I need to have a chat with you about something <laughs> and you knew straight away You know the gist of it and he, he said, you know, I've been uh, you know seeing my dental nurse and my wife's found out and uh, So there's like a bit of an atmosphere at the surgery Yeah, which well, I mean there would be wouldn't there, you know, especially if the wife's a hygienist or something <laughs> uh, And so and you know, he says so she's got to go to which my reply was always which one are we talking about? Because <laughs> we used to, we used to, we didn't, we're not judgmental. I mean, we provide advice. If you want to get divorced, we'll provide advice. If you want to uh, sack your dental nurse unfairly, then we'll provide advice. Um, our advice would be not to. Both. <laughs> that applies to both. Although, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of dentists do marry their dental nurses, but far more of them don't. And uh, a lot of people get divorced and they don't seem like the happiest people to me. My Mrs. Angry and I have been married for since 1983, so that's getting on for 34 years in this autumn. And uh, I always said, and I have two daughters, so I've had to make two speeches at two weddings. And I always say to people, if they ask, you know, what's the secret of a long marriage? I always say, just don't get divorced. <laughs> It's as simple as that, you know. If you ever get to the point where you think, I hate this cow, or I hate this bastard, I can't, what's the worst thing I could do to him? I hate him so much. <laughs> How can I really, really, you know, piss him off or piss her off? The answer is stay married to them and make the rest of the life a misery. That's my advice. <laughs> well, it's worked for me. Anyway. 
so yeah, so so dental nurses. Let's just go through the, the whole. I mean, I'm going to try and put in 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 sort of uh, ten minutes what I've learned over thirty years. And I qualified in eighty one, well, sort of started working in eighty two, and I was a practice owner in eighty three. So I didn't hang about as an associate all that long. So I've had a practice on and off, you know, since nineteen eighty three. So that's sort of that's a that's the year I got married. So thirty four years. And uh, uh, and obviously employed staff and employed a lot of dental staff over the years. Although our turnover hasn't been that big. Um, in fact, when I bought this latest surgery, I was pleased to get a lot of phone calls from nurses who'd worked for me in the past, saying that if there was a vacancy, that they would they'd love to come and work, um, which was a shame because we couldn't take them all on. Uh, but uh, no, I have quite a low staff turnover, and the reason is that uh, uh, I have sort of quite a liberal view to employment, which is that uh, you know it's it's not a case of an employer trying to enforce uh, a state of affairs on the employee. It's I see that this is two adults really just trying to uh, work together to um, <clears throat> sort of. To, for, the, for the betterment of the business, you know, which all which fits into the teleocratic style, my management style, the teleocratic style, which means management by shared purpose. The three management styles are um, autocracy, which is where you've got one sort of dictator at the top of the heap just telling everybody what to do and, and nobody can do anything without checking with them first. And So the sort of the Kim Jong-un style of uh, leadership. And then... Uh, then the next stage, I mean, eventually what happened was people couldn't, you know, when, when Henry Ford ran the Ford Motor Company, he couldn't have everybody ringing him up and saying, look, Mr. Ford, you know, uh, this uh, door handle won't fit on properly, what should we do? So what they tried to do was sort of distill the essence of the company, you know, into a series of, to write it down and say, look, you know, don't keep asking me. I've written this all down. As long as you follow the book, what I've written down, then you'll be fine. And that uh, gave birth to the second uh, management style, which is bureaucracy, which is basically everything's written down and you have to do it by the book. And if you don't do it by the book, then you're in, you're in trouble. The book replaces the autocrat. And then <clears throat> there's a sort of a more enlightened management style. And, and I think a much easier one, to be honest, because you don't have to write everything down. And that is a teleocratic management by shared purpose. And then what you do is you just say to people, look, this is what we're about. This is what we're trying to achieve. These are the resources we've got. This is where we are now. Uh, and providing you sort of, you're working in line with our agreed objectives, then really you've got quite a degree of your own autonomy, you know, in terms of how to do it. Now, I know we're off the I know we're off the subject, and this is okay. Just bear with me. So, you've got a teleocratic management style, management by shared purpose. So what's the purpose? You say, well, okay, well, how do you define the purpose? You know, how do you make sure that the purpose stays in everybody's head? How do you stop people working to their own purposes? You know, they might might their purpose might be to make themselves rich, not you. So, basically, you have to keep your purpose quite simple. And, this, and a very, very simple purpose, which is the one that we use, is to do good quality dentistry, make money and have fun. Okay, now there's three elements to that. But overall, overall, they inform and guide everything we do. So uh, making money is not, is not because we are greedy or because we want to be rich. It's because making money is necessary to do what we do. We have to make a profit. You can't run a dental surgery at a loss. It has to at least break even or make a profit. Um, doing good quality dentistry, well that again that's an ethical question. It's about our ethics. Do we, you know, do we want to have fun and make a load of money uh, doing work which is unethical? No we don't. That's an ethical statement. So that's our finances and our ethics covered. And then have fun. Um, and that you know, it sort of states a bit about our approach to life. You know, what uh, it's a it's a philosophical arm, if you like, of our uh, our uh, shared purpose. So, do good quality dentistry, make money, and have fun. And if you and 
you know, if you're sort of steeped in management speak, you'll realise that that's a sort of a mission statement. You say, oh, well, wait a minute, that's a mission statement. <laughs> and I suppose it is, you know, and mission statements got a bad press, didn't they? Because they, they became overloaded, you know, and people had these pretentious and, and, and wordy mission statements that nobody could remember and, uh, and, and couldn't stick to, you know, <laughs> probably didn't even understand. So all of my staff know what we are trying to do at that surgery because it's simple and because it's simple they can remember it because it's, they can remember it all the time they can stick to it so I might have to carry the cover nurses tomorrow <laughs> so, so okay so how do you manage it in a teleocratic style well I mean first of all you have to accept that people are adults and you have to in a way um, hold them accountable for the fact that they are adults and that they are not, you know, because we've all, I mean, I know, I know what the great British working class are like. I mean, you know, I, when I was a student, I worked in, uh, in the summer in factories, just earning money when I was off, you know, from dental school. And I have seen the great British working class. I've, I've worked alongside them in their factories and I know, I know what they're like. You know, I know their sense of humor. I know their, um, you know their sort of tacit resistance to management and uh, I've seen it in action and uh, their, their sort of determination to turn up at work and do the job that they'd like to do not necessarily the job that they're being paid for <laughs> or that the management would like them to do um, and you know and it's a badge of honor really and it's a sort of a how can I put it it's not they're not they're not they're not the criminal classes in any way, but in the, in the way the criminal classes have got a sort of an ethos, the working classes have got an ethos as well. And so, and what you don't want is you don't want anyone with that ethos. You don't really want, I mean, we've had a, an inquiry from a member who says that um, he's suffering personally, financially, because um, he's got a, effectively a lazy receptionist, a receptionist who, who spends most of her time on Facebook and, uh, and invents patients you know, makes up patients and makes appointments for patients who are real patients but have no intention of coming in because she just likes an easy life, you know, she likes it when there are no patients around. Um, and that is a, a classic case of a, a sort of a working class mentality gone wrong. Um, the one of the things I like to do, I mean, and in, in that problem, the problem in that case was that the principal was never there. It's one of these, it's one of these principals who sort of got a string of surgeries and, uh, you know, like a mini, what I call a mini group, and uh, in, in the hope that, you know, one day they might get bought out by a slightly larger group eaten by a larger fish, which is eaten by a whale. Um, bit Harry Nielsen reference there for you. Um, but he's only there one day a week. And when he's there, he's really busy. And so and this, this guy's an associate, so how can he go to the boss and say, look, uh, this associate is uh, making up appointments <laughs> for patients. You know, because the, the principal, it's gonna be quite difficult for the principal to have to ring up the patient and say, look, I know she didn't turn up for this appointment. Did you actually make it? I mean, who does that, you know? Uh, this guy's an intelligent guy, the receptionist. He's, he's, he's found a little loophole, which will, it's going to work brilliantly until uh, you know the, the uh, practice principal notices what he's doing, and then obviously he'll he'll have lost his job, and that'll be his references up the spout. But you know, if the surgery is profitable, or if the if the if the practice is uh, the owner is under the impression that the, he's run off his feet every time he's there, and and it's uh, you know, and it's just not making as much profit as it could do, then how's he going to know? You know. But no, you're. Occasionally, you get staff who come up to you and say, "You know, look, uh, you know, I decided that uh, I found some gloves, and they're either either the same quality, or, and they're a lot cheaper, or they are they're a better quality, but they're a bit more expensive. Should we get them? Can, can I buy them?" And it, that's quite difficult because when you're sort of changing over to this teleocratic style, you have to say to them, "Look, okay, what?" What do you, you know? What would you do? What's your opinion? You know, what's your? Oh, I think we should definitely buy them. Okay, off you go and buy them. Okay. Um, the next step up is when they come back and say, uh, "Oh, 
we um, need some. Uh, I think we should keep more. I don't know. I don't know anything. Amoxicillin. We could keep more amoxicillin in the cupboard. Uh, shall I get that organised? And 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 you recognise this is the person that's come to you the first time and asked you something that you said, yeah. What do you think? And they've, you know, you can see the old steam coming out of their ears. And okay. And I, and so the second time they say something like this, you say, well, look. Um, you know, my job here is really to, uh, do, you know, do the accounts or whatever, or in the A's with the bank manager, take the high level decisions. I'm, I'm the sort of the captain of the ship. I decide where we're going to go on our next cruise. I don't decide, uh, you know, what, what the passengers are going to eat every evening or, or cook it. You know, I am, at the moment, I'm in the middle of uh, doing something. You can make up something important, you know. I'm in the middle of doing something. What do you think? And they will say, okay, well, yeah, okay, I think we should do it. And then, then occasionally, when, when they realize, when they sort of twig what you're doing, as they're sort of walking away, they'll say, uh, you know, I just, thought it would, I just thought it would be best to run it past you. And to which you reply, mm, probably best if you don't. <laughs> and then, then the third time they come in and they say, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, there's nobody booked in, between now and going home time and I've got two hours owing is it all right if I go home and when you recognize it's the third time that they've asked you something like this you say look I'm not going to tell you again stop bothering me with all these decisions that you could be taking yourself if you want if you think if it fits in with our teleocratic objectives of making money doing good quality dentistry and having fun then f off <laughs> And it's a big culture shock, you know, for the staff. It really is a massive culture shock. Now, I know what you're gonna. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking angry. And Pilot gave my staff that degree of latitude. They would run riot. They would be ordering whatever they liked. They would be taking off what time they liked. They would be, you know. And to which I say, they won't. I mean, really seriously, that they've got enough brakes on them. They're sensible enough to realise that their careers would be nasty, brutal, and short if they did that. Uh, because, not because you you're going to say, oh, and no, actually, I was only pretending. I'm actually an autocrat. This teleocratic stuff was just a bluff. But no, because they know that um, they're responsible to the practice and to the other members of staff for for the success or otherwise of their actions. And they staff blossom under these sort of responsibilities. Now you're saying to them, look, you are a grown up. This is your business as well as mine, although I take all the profit. And, uh, you know, so, you know, it's in your interest that it's successful. So, you know, so for example, my staff, they organize their own rotors. I don't even know who's gonna be at work today. They'll, they'll have organized that. If they're off sick, they organize uh, sick cover. If, you know, I, when I turn up, the surgery is pretty well stocked. I'm not saying we never run out of anything we do, but it's all handled. You know, everything, all of a sudden, everything gets handled. And it's so great for you because you're, you're sitting there thinking, oh, do you know, I've got, I've got like four or five adults working with me now instead of working against me all four. Uh, and you just can't, you can't have the situation where they're just asking you all day, can I do this? Should I do that? You know, it's, it gets you down gets you down because what you're doing is you're training them to think independently and that's what you're you should be paying for I mean if you want drones then then by all means you know pay for drones and get drones in fact you can pay for drones and get independently thinking people just as easily this is the this staff thing is that what you're doing is realizing the potential of the staff that you've got they are they're all they should be extremely you know lovely people and friendly and, and intelligent and Treating them as drones uh, really just stifles them and stymies any sort of creativity. And but most most importantly, it stymies productivity. And productivity is what we're really looking for, isn't it? You know, it's it's uh, getting more out of the same amount of resources. Anyway, what I've done, I've gone off on a bit of a bender there about management styles, but um, the uh, you know, I mean, that's probably a bit more interesting than a boring lecture about how to recruit dental nurses using the local newspapers although I may have one of those in store for you so 
anyway, this is Angry signing off. It's a Friday, and uh, I think this will probably go out on the Monday. So I shall. I'm off to work now, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye. What, what is our mission statement? What is our? Do good dentistry. Have fun. Have fun and make money. Excellent. Well done. There's only only a bit of prompting. No, I knew. I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to say laugh a lot, but that, that was have fun. Okay. <laughs>